give you a very brief introduction, the same introduction I gave you last Sunday to the book of Romans. The book of Romans is actually a letter. It was a letter written by the Apostle Paul uh, around A.D. 57. And it was written to believers in Rome. And the theme of this letter is the gospel. The gospel. So chapter 1. We're going to read once again this week verses 1 through 17. Romans 1, 1 through 17. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for the gift of your holy word. We have read this portion from the gospel, or about the gospel, in the book of Romans. Lord, may you open up its truth to our hearts and our minds this morning. Lord, may we see in your word, the great power and the great gift that the gospel is to us and for us. So Lord, we pray that you might bless this time in your word, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. The word gospel, as you might know, means good news. You may have noticed in verse 1, the very first verse, the gospel is called the gospel of God. So this is God's gospel that Paul is speaking of. God's gospel. So this is not just any good news. This is God's good news. The gospel of God. It's the best good news The gospel, as Paul says in verse 16, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. God's gospel is about salvation. Salvation to everyone who believes. We talked about this last week. That we need to be saved from the wrath of God because of our own unrighteousness. We are guilty of unrighteousness. There is no hope for us unless God made a way 
of salvation. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. The gospel is also called the gospel of the Son of God later on in this passage. That Jesus died for our sins. Though we deserve to be punished for our own unrighteousness, God made a way for his son, Jesus Christ, to be punished. He willingly chose to do that for us so that he took our sin and then we received his righteousness. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, we become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so that is the gospel, what God has done for us, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This is the best good news. There is a way of salvation. And this gospel is good news that everyone, everyone needs to hear and believe. It's often said that good news is for sharing. And that we like to share good news. Uh, really, social media is built on a lot of this, about sharing good news. Some people will even do something so that they can share it later on on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, uh, post some pictures about what they did. Uh, we love to share good news. We want to receive those likes, those positive comments. Good news is for sharing. If the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's gospel, is good news, then why is it so difficult for us to share it with others? If it's good news, the best good news, and good news is for sharing, why is it so difficult for us to share this news with others? Well, let's think of social media. And if you were to post something about the gospel, maybe a verse of scripture that talks about the gospel, or maybe a comment about how people need to be saved, how many likes would we get from that? Well, we'd probably get some likes if we have some Christian friends on social media. But how many non-believers would like that post? Maybe we'd even get some negative comments about what the Bible says or what we had to say about the gospel. What makes the gospel difficult to share is the fact that most people don't want to hear it. It's, it's different than other types of good news, like a birth announcement. Everyone wants to hear about that, and everyone will congratulate you and be happy for you. But the good news of the gospel is different. Uh, those who don't believe the gospel usually don't want to hear it. And so we could say, well, good news is for sharing. The gospel is the best good news. But the reality is that it's not like other types of good news that people want to hear. It's a type of good news that people don't want to hear. That was the same in Paul's day. People really didn't want to hear the gospel. In his first letter to the Corinthians, he writes, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So people heard the gospel, the message of the cross, how Jesus died for our sins and rose again. And to most people, it sounded like foolishness. We could even say stupidity. It was foolish to them. They thought to themselves, how could some guy, some Jew who died on a cross, how could he save me? How could he bring me salvation? Someone crucified. And this talk about how he is risen from the dead, that even makes it sound crazier. This gospel, and the same is true in today's world. Uh, maybe it's not as new to most people as it was back then when the gospel was first preached, but still to people, to many people, it sounds foolish. It sounds crazy. That we're trusting in some person who lived 2,000 years ago to bring us salvation from our sins and to give us eternal life. It really doesn't make too much sense. And then there's the part about how we are sinners, how we're guilty before God, and that is offensive to people. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear about how we need a Savior. Savior. 
And there are some people who want us to be ashamed about the gospel. People who will mock the gospel, uh, ridicule the, the gospel. Some people will just hear it and won't say anything. But maybe inside they're not really happy to hear it. But then there are others who are antagonistic to the gospel, who will make fun of us. We see that on social media all the time, depending on who you talk to. Uh, there are lots of people on there who are quick to mock Christians. And sometimes Christians are worthy of being mocked, but not the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But people don't want to hear the gospel, they don't accept it, and they will mock it. Still though, even though it might not be easy for us to share the gospel, no, there are some people who thrive on being ridiculed, I think, but the most of us aren't like that. Most of us want to be liked, and uh, we believe the gospel, and we know that it is supposed to be shared by us who are the followers of Christ. But still, there's that thought about how will people react to it. And oftentimes, there's a negative reaction. But still, even though this was the case, and Paul, in the eyes of the world, was a nobody... He was going to the big, powerful city, or he hoped to go to the big, powerful city of Rome, preaching this gospel, the message of Christ crucified, the message of the cross, a message that to most people in that day was foolishness. Still, though, and knowing all of the persecution and the hardship he went through, he still felt that this was something he needed to do and wanted to do. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, I am under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He says, under obligation. He believed that he was under obligation to people who had not yet heard the gospel, including people in Rome. The New King James Version says, I am a debtor. How could Paul be a debtor to these people who had not yet heard the gospel? I am a debtor. Well, imagine if someone were to give me $100 and they told me, I want you to give that money to one of you. Well, then I would be under obligation to give that money to you. I really am in your debt now because I have this money that is supposed to go to you. I'm a debtor. And so in the, sort of the same way, God has given to us the gospel. Jesus sent first the apostles out and sent really everyone out who is a follower of Christ to share this good news. And so in that way, we are under obligation to do this. We are debtors to those who have not yet heard the gospel. And Paul believes that even though there will be people who will mock the gospel, maybe he will even get uh, thrown in prison or even executed for this, he still must share it. Now most of us, well I don't think any of us, are to the level of the Apostle Paul in uh, knowing the gospel and being able to explain it. But that's not an excuse. We can share what God has done for us. We can share that Christ died for our sins. He's given us hope, forgiveness. And so even though it's not easy, even though it's good news, it's not easy, but still like Paul, we should see ourselves as under obligation to share it, even as a debtor to others who need to hear it. The gospel is good news that everyone Everyone needs to hear and believe. So Paul says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We must not forget that the gospel is about a person who was humiliated on a cross. It's about Jesus who is humiliated on a cross. 
on a Roman cross while enduring excruciating pain of crucifixion. He was naked for all to see. He was mercilessly mocked by his enemies. Part of the purpose of crucifixion was to humiliate the person dying on a cross. It wasn't just the pain, but it was the shame, the humiliation. Jesus endured that. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce writes, to die by crucifixion was to plumb the lowest depths of disgrace. It was a punishment reserved for those who were deemed most unfit to live. And that's how Jesus, our Lord and Savior, died. Really the one who is God in human flesh, the one who created all things. He died, or was put to death, in a way deemed, oh, or in a way in which people who were crucified, they were seen really as the least fit to live. Imagine that. Jesus died in that way, put to death in that way, suffering the shame of the cross. And so I don't believe that the gospel in the eyes of the world is ever going to be cool. Uh, we might try to dress it up a little bit, uh, modernize the words. We might find some celebrity who has become a Christian and get them to share their testimony. And these things are good, I think. But we should never get to the point where we think that somehow we can make the gospel cool to the world. If we get to that point, probably we've changed the gospel and we're preaching some sort of different gospel that doesn't mention sin or need of a savior. It's never going to be cool, but still the Bible says, and we see this in the world today, that people will still accept the gospel, will still believe the gospel and put their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit. We are to do our best you know, wherever we go, in whatever situation we find ourselves, to be a witness and to, if we have the opportunity to share the gospel with someone who needs to hear it. But in the end, knowing that we need the Holy Spirit to, to convict that person of their need of salvation, to show them uh, their sin and their need of Christ. So the gospel will never be cool, but we can't be ashamed of it, even though people will try to put us to shame. We can't be ashamed of the one who was humiliated on a cross for us. We can't be ashamed of Christ and his gospel. In the book of Romans, Paul will, as you may know, write a lot about the gospel, especially in the first part of the gospel. He'll present why we need the gospel. He'll talk about how we receive the gospel or how we put our faith in Christ and are made uh, righteous before God. He'll talk about uh, how that, what that means in our lives today. And so he'll talk over and over again about the gospel. And there might come a point, uh, if you're here each Sunday, where you might start to think, well, I've already believed the gospel, so can't we go on to something else? But I want you to see what Luke writes in verse 15. I read it already a couple of times, but you may have missed this. He says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Look at that word, you. Again, who is he writing to? He's writing to believers in Rome. To you also who are in Rome. He wanted to preach the gospel to them. To people who had already put their trust in Jesus. People who had already believed and accepted the gospel and were saved. And so the gospel is not only for those who have not yet believed, it's also for everyone who has already believed. We can't leave the gospel and then go on to something else. The gospel needs to be at the center of everything. And so I'm just warning you that Paul will talk a lot about the gospel but this, I believe, still, even though we've already believed it, most of us here, maybe all of us here, 
we still need to hear it. Because I believe it's when we forget about the gospel and what it's all about that we begin to drift away from the righteousness of God. Which really is basically loving God and loving others. That's what it means to be righteous, to follow God's commands, to love Him, to love others. Uh, Paul talks about the obedience of faith in verse 5. And so we believe and that faith in Jesus as our Lord leads to obedience. So when we start to forget about the gospel, maybe in our daily life, then that's when we drift from God's will or maybe we do or say or think something that is contrary to the righteousness of God because we've forgotten about the gospel. I just want to show you a few verses and passages where Paul makes this connection between uh, the gospel and the obedience of faith or righteousness, how we are to live right, right living. These are in Paul's other letters. How the gospel gives us a desire to do what is right, to love God, to love others. Uh, the gospel, first of all, gives us the desire to surrender our lives to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one had died for all. That's the gospel. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all. And those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. We naturally want to live for ourselves. That's unrighteousness. Doing whatever we feel we want to do and really forgetting about others and forgetting about God. The gospel gives us the desire to surrender our lives to God because Christ gave up his life for us. Uh, the gospel also gives us the desire to love others. Ephesians 5.2 Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So if Christ was willing to do that for me, I should be willing to walk in love, to love others as Christ has loved me. Uh, the gospel gives us the desire to give. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And that's speaking of Jesus, how he humbled himself, was willing to be humiliated on a cross. He gave up the comfort, the glory, the praise of heaven to come down into this world to be mocked and rejected and crucified. And so if he gave up so much, what are we willing to give to him? And that speaks not only of money, but just giving ourselves to God and others. Uh, the gospel gives us the desire to rid ourselves of self-centeredness. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each one to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What mindset is this? Well, Paul says, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, and by becoming obedient, or by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He adds that even death on a cross, because Paul understood uh, the horror and the shame of crucifixion, even death on a cross. If there was anyone who deserved to be conceited, it was Jesus, who is above all. But he put us before himself. 
the opposite of selfish ambition that we often have, putting us first as we are to put one another before ourselves. And that really is what love is all about. The gospel gives us the desire to forgive. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Reminded of that story that Jesus told about uh, the servant who was forgiven that unpayable debt by the king. Millions and millions, even billions of dollars in our currency today. And yet he went out and demanded that his fellow servant pay him up a very small debt and unwilling to forgive that person. We might think that God has forgiven us a little, but we would be mistaken. We don't understand, I think, the greatness of our sin, the awfulness of our sin in the eyes of God. He forgave it all. And we must be willing to forgive as God in Christ forgave us. The gospel gives us the desire to avoid sexual sin. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own for you were bought with a price. That price was the blood of Jesus. Again, the gospel. That Christ died for us. And then finally the gospel gives husbands the desire to love their wives. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Gave up his life for her, which is us. Again, to love others, especially our husband, our wife. We could also uh, say both of these because though it mentions just husbands loving their wives, it needs to be, of course, both ways, but I think husbands are to take the lead in that as Christ first loved us. And so over and over again, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but over and over again, Paul makes this connection between the gospel and how we are to live. And if we start to forget about that gospel, if we don't hear it or remind ourselves of it, then we can start to lose that desire to, to love others when it becomes difficult. Uh, we can be quick to be not tender-hearted, but quick to say and do things and think things that don't show love for God or love for others. And so what I'm saying is that we should not be ashamed of the gospel and we should also not grow tired of the gospel. We must share the gospel with others, everyone who has not yet heard or not yet believed the gospel, but we must also preach this gospel to ourselves, to our own hearts, to even rebuke ourselves when we find that our love is cold or we're not willing to forgive, to remind ourselves of what Christ has done for us. And I, I think that will give us, I know that will give us the desire uh, eventually, to the working of the Holy Spirit to change our thinking, our acting that is contrary to the will of God. The gospel needs to remain the center of our lives. It's not something we believe at some point in the past and we become saved and then we go on to other things. The gospel needs to remain the center of our lives. And it's not just something we share with others. That we need to do that, should do that, but we also need to first preach it to ourselves to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, to be like Christ. And of course, that will make our witness in this world more effective. Not ashamed of the gospel, and also not tired of the gospel. And so we're going to hear lots about the gospel in the book of Romans. 
It's the center of our lives as believers. And it's the message that we have to share with others. Those who have not yet believed and also those who have already believed. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the gospel, for the good news of Christ, for what he was willing to do for us. We who are so undeserving of the great sacrifice that was made, We are amazed when we think of the pain and the humiliation that he endured for us. And Lord, may we as his followers be willing to live as you would want us to live, to love you and to love others. May our lives not be only about ourselves, but may we live out what we see in the gospel. A God who put us before himself, who served us in coming to give his life as a ransom for us. So Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would touch our hearts, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.